for show. Right. Hello and welcome. Hello. For anyone standing in the back who would like to take a seat, we do have a few seats available here in the front. Don't be shy. So welcome to make your way. We won't call on you. <laughs> there will be no good. I'm Rochelle Cavalier. I am the Vice President of Sales for Douglas Element Development, and I oversee the project, the residences at Mandarin Oriental, Boca Raton. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jay Parker. I'm the CEO of Douglas Element in Florida. And I think I'm just really good at finding good people. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica Delvecchio, I'm the Economic Development Manager for the City of Boca Raton. I'm Michael Kravitz. And uh, tax manager for engineering tax services in West Palm Beach, and uh, I'm a licensed CPA. I'm glad here to share any information that you're looking for relative to taxation. And it's interesting, Michael, because this there's a lot of the reasons that we're here and we're seeing all this positive is through the mystery of tax law. Uh, one of the things that has happened, beginning uh, in, in the topic of this uh, get-together, is about tax migration. The idea that we've had in the New York City metro area, which is one of the highest tax and highest price property markets in the United States, we've had for years many uh, wealthy sort of on the fence. You know, hey, should I go to Florida now? Should I wait? What should I do? And the new tax law that came into effect on January 1st, 2018, I think for many, pushed them uh, to make that decision. But it's not exclusively to the, the demographic of the wealthy, which we're going to talk about. But it's, it's pretty amazing. And then the other thing is, to use a really tired baseball analogy, everybody says, hey, what inning are we in? Right? And I'd say we're still driving up to the ballpark. I mean, we're, this is just getting started. This is... This is new, and, and the reason why it's new is because what's happening in the city, or in the, in the Northeast New York City metro area, is basically um, the, the new law, the key attribute of it is caps on how much you can basically write off. And they relate to SALT, which I, this is such a lame joke, but I call it I, I was raised salt and strategic arms and implementation treaty, but now it means state local taxes. And state local taxes are capped, and so is property taxes. Um, and that's something that is making the cost of home ownership in other markets um, more expensive. And you're looking at low, low or no tax markets like Florida, is all of a sudden having an additional advantage between the weather and all sorts of other advantages you always have. So it's kind of interesting. Um, what I'd like to do first is, I'd like to ask Michael, since um, this is the first time in my life that I've ever really wanted to know about taxes, <laughs> and, and what I'd love to do is just to give you, like, give us a 50 cent overview of what the SALT tax issue is. Well, first of all, SALT and the definition of tax migration mainly um, is going from a high tax state to a low tax state. Examples of that, of course, would be New York, California, high tax states, uh, Florida, of course, is a low tax state because there's zero income tax. That's one of the driving factors with respect to the tax migration. Additionally, though, with the recent tax law change of reducing uh, the real estate tax as an itemized deduction to only $10,000 I personally have seen people just have their jaws drop when they realize how much more money they have to pay in taxes from a wealthy perspective. I'm saying this too, mainly, because I've seen a lot of people paying twenty-five and thirty-five thousand in real estate taxes, which aren't that unusual. You drop that down, cut off twenty thousand dollars of that, you come up with a very big tax bite. So to offset that is you come to a low tax state like Florida and it helps to minimize that particular uh, reduction in real estate taxes. Just to give you a real quick overview though, um, 2000 to 2017, they had the largest what they call net migration between states. 
with um, about 14 million people uh, moving from high tax states to low tax states. Uh, now, with the tax reduction that I've referred to, particularly the reduction in the real estate taxes, it's predicted that high tax states such as California and New York will lose about 6% of their populations by 2028. And the zero and low tax states like Florida uh, will experience about a 25% population growth. Wow. That's what we're expecting. That's, 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 uh, that's put supply and demand into the equation. You know? And that's one of the things we're seeing now. Jessica, uh, one of the things that we know, uh, you know, when I think of the New York City metro, I think of Wall Street and financial services and, you know, drivers of big income. We've had a little bit of uptick in uh, sort of the I don't want to say dot com, but sort of the tax sector. However, you know, the, those, the, the Wall Street sort of se sector of high wagering is pretty flat. And yet here, there's some, uh, I read somewhere that something like 15,000 new securities uh, uh, industry employees uh, came to Florida or were created this year. Maybe so we put that under the sector of financial services industry. That's hedge funds right now. working hedge fund at Connecticut, and they're Connecticut, and San Diego, and Connecticut. Who? But they all open a small office here, which they have to have the address for Greenwich for their billion-dollar hedge fund. But they still, the executives still want to come to Florida. They still want to take advantage of the, the low taxes. They want the access to the airport. Seventy thousand flights come through that airport. We're a city of ninety-four thousand people. Figure that out. That's a lot of flights coming through. So these are the players that use that executive airport. Um, right now, we moved in about six months ago. We moved in uh, Stover Glass. Stover Glass is an RAA. Uh, they've been on Wall Street for 50 years. Never had an office off of Wall Street. It's uh, their headquarters on Wall Street, but they moved to Boca Raton. Um, they're oh, seeing. Oh, why? Well, for the taxes. But, but not just the taxes. It's not the taxes. I mean, that's great. The execs come for the taxes. But <laughs> <laughs> lock me in and see about. Okay, um, so the executives come for the taxes. You know, that's why these high paying jobs, and they're smaller. We're not seeing projects with, you know, we have modernized minutes with 800 jobs. But these execs, they make two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. So that's a lot of money to them. But also the quality of life. I mean, look around. You can't be from or or even South Florida for what we offer. When we talked about a commute, you know, there is no getting on the train for two hours and then coming and getting to the office. And, you know, we just don't have that. We have roads and we have tribal and all of that. But it really is a lifestyle that sells itself as long as we get them here to show You don't have enough sort of gray overcast weather. No, <laughs> we send that up north, <laughs> along with the taxes. And, and are there other industries besides Wall Street that are being attracted to Boca and the surrounding areas? Yes, so we go through EFI, which is uh, the Enterprise Foreign Fund for Incentives. We actually incentivize companies to come here. We sell a lot of technology. We have a number of corporate headquarters that we've moved here over the last four years. Big names for us, shoes for crews, mobile health, modernizing medicine. Right there, that's about eight, nine, ten, like about 1,500 jobs to our city. High paying jobs. So we do corporate, you know, we keep it diversified. We have healthcare, we have finance, we have um, technology. So, yes, we see a variety of things. We do that by design to diversify. And, and so the idea is more jobs. More jobs, more but people. Higher paying jobs. Yes, because we want them to truly come in and live, work, play. We want them to live here. But, but uh, in terms of the demographics coming here, this isn't a narrative about a bunch of hedge fund people just coming to Boca, right? This is a younger... It's more than that, yes. So we're aging younger. About three months ago, Forbes reached out to our office and um, they wanted analytical data. They wanted to know what's going on in our city. We have all these projects coming online downtown. You know, we're really... Eight. They want to know what average income is, uh, average age, uh, level of education for the residents. And as we pr provide the demographics, what we all noticed was that we're aging younger, which was a surprise to almost all of us. We use census bureaus, so we go 10 years back and 10 years forward, maybe 11 years by the time we were looking at the data. And in 11 years, we'll be three years older. I mean, I would love to be really? only three years older in 11 years. Yeah. I mean, you can't model that. But 
that shows that we are aging younger. So these companies are bringing younger talent in. We have universities here. You see it yourselves. People are coming in buying these homes. They're knocking them down. They're moving their families in. Just last year, Boca uh, donated 14 acres to the state to put in an elementary school. That right. shows that we're truly aging younger. So, so the bottom line is that the companies are coming here because of the affordability, but also because they can find talent uh, to to work for these firms, right? Interesting. Um, go ahead. I would just add, you say that we can't bottle this age youth fountain, <laughs> but in many ways, that's exactly what's happening. If you look at the development in Boca, historically the luxury development was always right in the ocean. Why do people want the ocean? Because they wanted to go sit on the beach all day long. What's happening now in a lot of major cities is that people are looking for a lifestyle where they can walk, where they can be entertained, where they don't necessarily sit on the beach all day, where the beach is still an option, but the lifestyle is generated by doing all the things that keep them active, keep them engaged. And it's no coincidence that products like the Mexican are coming into these markets in this way. They're speaking specifically to the demographic that we know is attracted to this market inherently, but now augmented powerfully by tax by the tax laws. And I think, and Jonathan and I have talked about this extensively, we think this is literally just the tip of the iceberg. And we hear numbers like a 25% surge. I think it will absolutely happen. And I think we also slightly underestimate the complexity, forget about the tax complexity, but also just in general, the complexity of picking up your life, potentially your business and all your employees, and moving them to a different state. The drive to do it is 100% a reality. The process by which that happens is gonna take time. But I can tell you, we have a relocation division in our company, the phone's ringing off the hook. A lot of it is exploratory. What would it take? What can they buy? What, and a lot of times, employers will say, we'll buy your home from you in New York or Connecticut or New Jersey or in California, and then we'll turn around and market that house and we'll work with a company like that was selling to sell it, and we'll give you a credit towards what you're gonna buy in South Florida. And a lot of them are focused on Boca because the values here are extraordinary. Even comparing Boca to markets like Miami, which obviously we're a proponent of all of South Florida, what you can buy here is less expensive on a price per foot basis than what you can buy in other major markets. So Boca really has a tremendous opportunity right now, and I think that's why we believe so firmly in Mandarin, residents of Mandarin Oriental, and everything that's happening in this market. And I personally believe, sorry for rambling on, but I personally believe that you're going to start to see in Boca the same thing that you've seen in Miami over the last 10 years, Many, many, many more New York-based institutions calling Boca home, from restaurants to clubs to like, all kinds of ancillary clothing stores. They're all saying, hey, our customers are all moving to Florida. We can save money by opening in Florida. Our tax basis is lower. The cost is lower. Let's go look and explore Florida. And it's happening in Boca's square in the middle. Right. Um, I'm going to ask if, uh, Rochelle something specific, but I just want to put this in, like, Flag and plant this flag on the beach that New Yorkers or the New Yorkers or the Northeast are the new foreign buyers. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, all the uh, you know the South American, Central American countries that were huge sources of demand um, have their own serious economic problems and they pulled back. But a lot of that missing demand has been replaced by the Northeast. Before the tax law, and and this is sort of exaggerating that further. It's not new. It's not new. It's not new, right? So during the recession and coming out of the recession, as you well recall, when the Canadian dollar was at parity, we were like, "Bienvenue à la right? <laughs> so like our Canadian friends, they were taking advantage of a unique set of economic circumstances where it made so much sense to come and live in South Florida if one were able, right? right? And then, you know, we saw pre-recession, right, is particularly well into South Florida in the Miami area, Bienvenido South Florida, right? So same thing, people having economic I, just, I took five years of French in high school. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. I'm not wrong. go ahead. You get the points. <laughs> so the idea is, you know, tax migration and economic, com coming to a new place for economic reasons is not new. And what we're seeing right now, if we go hyper-focused on Boca Raton, is that we are now ramping up to meet a demand that we are foreseeing. 
So Boca Raton, going back like 30, 40 years ago, of course that was before my time. <laughs> Love you, Jay Parker. Really? So um, before my time, Boca Raton was highly, highly seasonal. So we're talking like 50-50 split. People just emptied out of here after Mother's Day or whatever spring holiday, and then they came back in the fall. So we're finding now it's far less seasonal. People are far less preoccupied with, you know, parking themselves on the, on the beach and roasting. <laughs> They're much more interested in walkable areas. And you can see the development in the downtown corridor. The residences at Mandarin Oriental Boca Raton is but one project. You know, even five years ago, it was like, I would like you and I would like Boca. So we were like, sorry, it doesn't exist. And so now we have multiple projects that are specifically catering to a more sophisticated buyer, an ultra high net worth buyer in a lot of cases. They have certain size requirements. They yeah, have I'm certain. Like, I'm going to ask you about that. What, Tell is, me. what is like the high net worth or the celebrity of a certain luxury buyer? Like, what, what are they looking for now compared to you know, five years ago? So interestingly, what we're seeing in Boca Raton specifically, in terms of ultra high net worth, high visibility, you know, um, I'm a member of the sports and entertainment division of Douglas Elliman. So that's a little background why he's asking me that question. So I've worked with a number of athletes who are moving to the Boca Raton area and she never gets to the been that, she never gets to mixed tickets. <laughs> so, I haven't worked with Nick yet, actually. I'll put that on my bucket list. So they're increasingly young. They increasingly are young, affluent, have families, and they have a really good idea of what's important to them. So Boca Raton is appealing for a number of reasons, and for this type of buyer, our schools are just wonderful. I mean, we have all A-rated public schools. We have 19 so, one so nine private schools. So they're buying the primary residences, not just a second second home type experience for them. It's, well, what's interesting cool. about athletes specifically is that they're taxed based on where they're earning. So your away games are taxed at a different rate than your home games, and many athletes can choose where they live. So given our tax laws, you, know, you can choose how many months you're going to be in certain places in a lot of cases, and you know if your family can live in the primary residence during that time, and it is advantageous for them. So we have a number of athletes who actually aren't on Florida teams. Interestingly enough, yeah. and they're choosing Boca Raton because it is a family-friendly, you know, up-and-coming, very tax-favorable. 